Hello, what's up, African Fight Farm? Is your boy JB back at it again with another exciting interview on the African Fighters platform. Uh, before I introduce our guest, uh, you probably already know from the thumbnail and the title of this video, but I have Farouk with me here today to co host. Farouk, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good to be here. Good to have another interview. All right. Uh, yes, so the big fish. Um, the big fish, Ejanla, in Nigeria, that means big fish. This is certainly the biggest interview we've ever done. Uh, this person is has traveled around the world, uh, very well traveled, had an incredible career before joining management, was a fighter, and now he is the president of Brave CF from Bahrain. Ladies and gentlemen, we have, we are honored to have Mr. Mohammed Shahid. Mr. Mohammed Shahid, thank you for honoring this and thank you and welcome to the show. No, thank you very much. You guys are doing an amazing job and it's a pleasure and honor for myself to be a part of this interview. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. We try as much as we can to uh, put a microscope, if you will, on African fighters, irrespective of the promotion or in respective of the combat sport discipline. We try to, to do that. And I believe uh, with the platforms out there we saw we certainly uh number one not that i'm trying to to beat my drums but we try to do that as much as we can all right uh without without uh taking too much of your time uh we are gonna jump right straight right into it farouk do you want to start with the first question please yeah yeah uh, nice to have you again mr shahid um i'll say you guys are doing a wonderful uh, job you've been doing an incredible job with brave um you guys started in 2016 um, in that time frame, we've organized over 80 events. So I, I would say 10 per year, averaging 10 per year. And um, and um, you've traveled um, uh, to different cities, over 40 cities, 30 countries across the world. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the journey, how you started there with Brave, and um, and how you've achieved so much in this short time frame. No, I, I, you're right. I think uh, in a short period of time, even uh, we've uh, actually surpassed our expectations as well. Uh, but uh, the directions and the goals of Brave was very clear from day one. Uh, before we even thought about having a uh, promotion or an organization like Brave, uh, our immediate goal was to start, um, let's say, an infrastructure or a program for talents uh, and how we can uh, develop talents, how we can create an ecosystem for MMA in Bahrain and uh, also do a study behind it of how talents in mixed martial art actually can grow if they are in a different uh, model of lifestyle um, similar to football how can they be in that different model and uh, make a difference you know so uh, that's how we started KHK MMA so KHK MMA as a as a team had uh, the likes of uh, Khabib uh, Nurmagomedov Islam Makhachev uh, Shorty Torres, who's fighting in the uh, Mauritius card in the main event, um, and a lot of other athletes uh, from the top tier to the athletes who are turning uh, pro from amateur, the athletes who are at the professional level, but uh, not at the top level, and at the same time, the amateur athletes as well. So we distribute them to four different tiers. Uh, and eventually, we gave them a lifestyle of what every other sports athlete should be uh, receiving um, when it comes to uh, the payments, to the infrastructure, to the training programs, to the opportunity of uh, accessing uh, top medias, and even at the same time, getting uh, the medical attention, recovery, nutrition, and everything else, as if they're working in a Real Madrid club, you know? So how would that turn these athletes? Uh, what would be the result? Uh, and the result was phenomenal. I mean, and not just, of course, you, the stories of Khabib and Islam Makhachev. I mean, that's something that we don't have to mention. But um, then you look at the stories of uh, Hamza Kohiji, Eldar Eldar, of Ashari Torres, to name a few, and uh, France Malambos. They have done really well in their careers um, and outside of their careers in the industry itself. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the real achievement was the amateur team and what they have achieved in their careers, you know. So we've seen the result. And the question really was that started Brave Combat Federation, where His Highness, the founder of Brave, Sheikh Khalid bin Hamad, he asked uh, a very important question. How can we do that for the rest of the world? You know, all the MMA fighters around the world. How can we implement this? This is not feasible to do. Uh, you can do it for 10 athletes, but not for 2,000 athletes. You know, how are we going to create a system that would organically 
change uh, the industry system that we are in today and take it to the next level and have uh, a structure that we have for football, that we have for um, every other top sports that's existing. And that's a successful business story. Um, and that's where we started Brave Combat Federation, where we knew that we have to touch every area of uh, the industry itself, whether it's a media platforms. A lot of people don't look at it that way. I mean, when you're looking at the industry, we're always talking about the athletes and the promotions. You're always uh, blaming the promoter or we're always blaming the athletes. Whatever it is, that's always been the conversation. But people don't realize that the gyms and the academies for mixed martial arts are also suffering around the world. MMA media platforms around the world are also suffering. Um, and uh, managers are really not managers. You know, They're not the agencies like other sports agencies as well. So it's only a few that are actually doing it you know, making what it is at the top level. You know, the question is the industry is really suffering and nobody really talks about it. I mean, nobody talks about the MMA industry and we had to take that stand and make sure that somebody has to be brave enough to go out there and talk about the industry and take care of the industry and contribute to the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And that should be the priority, not your ticket sales, yeah. or your pay-per-views. Um, and that was where our focus was for Brave. And uh, we created a strategy to be part of the same industry. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that we are different today. We are in the event business like every other promotion, but behind the scenes, which nobody else sees, is what we have actually built from how we can scout these talents, go to the countries where nobody would want to go because of the business reasons and mm -hmm. build the economy there and mm -hmm. partner with uh, local organizations, national federations, and at the same time, build the international governance of mixed martial arts um, that a lo lo lot of promotions won't really care about having or not having because it doesn't mm -hmm. matter to them. So we've been part of all of that and Brave has been the center uh, of uh, creating this uh, structure of everything that we go to. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely the result is what we like to talk about. And when we look at the results today, traveling to 30 countries in five continents is one thing. Uh, having 82 events now in just eight years time or less than eight years time is another thing. But that's all, you know, milestones and achievements. But the, what's the result behind it is to create a Benoit Santini, is to create Ilya Tapuyas, is to create Gamza Chimayevs and Mahmoud Makayevs and Johnny Walkers and they can go on and on. And that's yeah. That's what really is the result of it, uh, uh, how we can scout talents and break them into faster superstars than any other organization. And that takes a toll on us to travel around the world and showcase these talents. But at the same time, to go and work with the local promotions and make sure that we are able to create a national ecosystem in these countries and uh, use our global values to join hands with the government sector and the private sectors and to bring their interest from the golf, cycling and every other sport to a little bit of their interest into mixed martial arts as well. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we will always be in this cocoon of mixed martial industry that we don't go outside of. And you go to the real sports industry. And a lot of yeah. people till today, the top players in sports, have not even looked at MMA as uh, the top three or top four sports mm -hmm. at this stage. So why uh, do we rely on having a $12 billion company and say that that's good enough for us? I would always mm -hmm. prefer to have an industry that has $23 billion companies rather than one $12 billion company. And that's the structure we need to create where talents, media platform, everybody is going to have a huge economic cake that they all can be a part of and take a piece of. Yeah, so uh, you met, you did mention, I want to jump in here, sorry, sorry to interrupt you with my ooms and ahs. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, you, you mentioned partnership uh, and obviously... You guys released a press press release about uh, your partnership with the Mauritius government. I did see a post as well where you specifically met the deputy prime minister of Mauritius. Um, you know what? Before I ask that question, I'm, I just have to commend your your your, your video skills here because I can see the clip here in your office looks very well framed. I love the framing, and your office is very nice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. You. All right. So uh, getting back into it. About Mauritius, how did that conversation come along and uh, are we seeing a future partnership going on in Mauritius with you guys? Definitely. I think um, it's, it's basically Africa as a whole. I mean, we always uh, thought of Africa as a continent that we need to be a part of. So when you break it down, it starts from uh, the world level. So the top of the pyramid is always the global world and how we can blend every continent to each other. Uh, but to do that, you have to break it down to the next level, which is the continental level. You have to look at Asia as one. You have to look at uh, Europe as another and you have to look at Africa as another continent. And we have to see how we can uh, uh, work in these continents as a whole as well. But again, you can take it down one notch and go into one continent and know that you have to go country by country. It is a grueling, intense, uh, aggressive process, which made me gain uh, maybe 70 kgs in the past eight years. And you wouldn't even recognize me uh, from my pictures uh, seven years back. But uh, 
somebody had sacrificed something, right? I mean, that that, that was the, that, that was the case, and, and 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 it's not easy. I mean, that's why a lot of organizations that's out there that could have done what we did very easily, but have not done it because somebody has to go out and do the dirty work, you know. And we made sure that we're com communicating with all the countries, all the government uh, that we have relationships with, at the same time utilize our interest relationships to make sure that we um, uh, work and share values and make sure that there's there's a there's a sports values that the countries can actually achieve um, and we know the sports values that uh, countries can achieve through football but we don't mm -hmm. know the sports values that the country can achieve through mma yes we talk about exposure but to the mma fans but not really to the country's uh, values of uh, international relationship foreign direct investment trade relationships uh, tourism exposure and those are the things a sport should actually provide uh, along with a structure that can develop the talents of the country and create more international superstars. Uh, so there's a lot of things that goes into it. And our conversation is always the same. That Brave uh, Foundation is to create the FIFA structure around the world. It's a it's a one-stop shop uh, for mixed martial arts as a whole. And everybody's going to be a part of it. Maybe Brave as a brand would not exist at that point because it's much more bigger than Brave and the industry becomes one. And But at the same time, it does not matter that everybody can plug into that uh, structure. And that is the most important thing. So uh, with Mauritius specifically, it's one of those countries that we have been having conversations with, I think maybe for two years now. It's not um, it's something that happened uh, recently. We've been communicating with all the governments and Mauritius was one of them. That we've had the same communications with. And uh, eventually we had uh, the opportunity to work with uh, the government of Mauritius, the Tourism Authority of Mauritius, uh, the Economic Development Board of Mauritius, and of course, uh, with the support of the Mauritius Mixed Martial Arts Federation and Mr. Avinash, to put everything together for us. And uh, that visit was about uh, discussing much more than brave. It's about discussing uh, national development program, infrastructure, academies, uh, scouting talents, and taking them internationally. And that's something we want to do across Africa for the next two years. We we just don't want to come and host events or take athletes internationally. I mean, that's one thing, but people don't realize that. Yes, we have one of the best talents in the world in Africa, in any sport, hands down, you know, and nobody questions that and we know it very clearly. But at the same time, they don't realize that the amount of uh, African athletes in Europe, uh, European football, you look at it and you don't realize that there's a huge movement for football academies in Africa. And that helps. You cannot just take athletes and hope that we don't care about the infrastructure and development programs in Africa. Somebody has to take that role as well. And everybody talks about Africa, everybody talks about development in Africa, but who's actually doing it? So for Brave, mm -hmm. we always say that we don't like to talk about our future and what we're going to do and who we're mm -hmm. going to be becoming. And we're going to be the first number one, number two, number three organization. No, we want to focus on what we've done. And let's talk about the results. You know, we yeah. have come to Africa and we're back in Africa and we have taken African talents internationally, 74 plus athletes. Uh, fought in Brave already from Africa, and now in the next two years, we want to go and build the infrastructure, academies, create uh, a structure for the media sectors, to the uh, management sectors, to the gyms, have value for everybody that the government sees as sports values, and then we get the support of all the way from government, private sectors to get involved yeah. in the economy that is fast growing. So we can yeah. make it happen, but together we can make it happen, not separated. Mm -hmm. So Mauritius, that was one country at a time, and they've understood that, and they've given us the full support to make it happen. Of course, um, we have to start somewhere, and we don't really care that if the event is in the magnitude of what, you, what we see in France or what we see in Serbia or what we see in Bahrain. I mean, those are mm -hmm. massive events that we put on. But uh, we are not going to look and say that, oh, we might sacrifice the quality from that. It doesn't matter. It's for a bigger purpose. The cost is mm -hmm. more bigger than the brand yeah. itself. And that's what we're fighting for. So we, we, uh, the moment we can host an event there, the country can see the value of tourism, can see the value of bilateral mm -hmm. relationships. That is a key important right. thing. And even more than that, to have inclusive to uh, African fighters to fight for their, defend their title in their own home continent. It can't get better than that for us. Yeah. Um, uh, Farouk, Farouk was supposed to take the next question, but you did mention something that caught my eye because uh, we do know that this is not your first time coming to Africa. Uh, you guys in 2018 were the first global promotion to come to Africa. You went to Morocco. You had uh, Utman Azaita in the main event. Great home reception. I believe that was the first time we saw a magnitude of an event like that in Africa at that point. And then you went to South Africa twice. So my question is about your current partnership with Mauritius for EFC uh, 82, uh, sorry, for Brave CF 82. Is it the same sort of like uh, deal when you went to South Africa like five years ago or is this something totally different with your approach this time? No, it is uh, totally different this time. I think uh, 
for us, uh, it's always about, uh, I mean, you have to start somewhere, so you have to set foot into the continent. And that's what we said, you know, you might end up sacrificing a lot of things uh, as entering into a market. And that's the reason a lot of people have not entered new markets. And we don't fear that, you know, and that's why from day one, we call ourselves and our organization's name is Brave. You have to be a little bit brave to do these kind of things. So we entered uh, the market uh, one way or the other. And uh, today we are coming coming into a system where it's a long-term plan. And uh, Mauritius is going to be a part of the African continental strategy. So once we have the government on board, you know, the private sectors on board, they see the event hosted in the country. They see the athletes having a development program, a roadmap for them from gym to glory structure, where they can go from a training in academy to an amateur structure, all the way to uh, fighting in their own country, to fighting internationally and becoming a global champion around the world. I mean, that's the whole roadmap we need to build. Uh, so that's the structure we are building, and it's not. It, it will take uh, the next two to three years of uh, making sure that this happens in multiple other African countries. But at the same time, working together between each other to make sure that there's a lot of ancillary events that goes on, uh, a lot of programs that we're planning on outside of the events, which is to build as much academies as possible, uh, work with uh, the goals of the continent and countries, and to make sure that uh, we support in that and uh, refine the industry a little bit more and of course with the support of the international amateur federation to build a stronger governance judging courses refereeing courses there's a lot of things that goes behind the scenes so we're looking at a national project of mma for each of the countries that we go to and not just looking at creating an event for brave and uh, uh, take the benefit of it you know so yeah it, it is a much more different uh, approach a much more long-term based approach and uh, more africa uh, focused approach all right, Farouk, take this one, please. Yeah, okay. Um, so, like Jibri mentioned, I uh, would like to commend you uh, and say officially that Brave is um, the first promotion. We've had a lot of promotion talking about bringing events to Africa. And um, to say it, Brave actually did that a long time ago, 2018, like you mentioned. And you guys staged three events in the space of one year. And it's good to see Brave back to Africa this May, Brave 82. But why? Uh, what, what happened? What, what took you guys um, this long? Five years. Um. We've not been to Africa. Are we going to see more Africa event this year? Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, thing was which we all faced was the pandemic. I mean, uh, three years of pandemic. People look at pandemic as just the two and a half years of uh, surviving pandemic, but uh, recovery from pandemic is another completely different story, you know. And a lot of people don't realize that Brave Combat Federation during pandemic is one of the uh, organizations that hasn't stopped doing their events. We continued and be became consistent of doing events during the pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, we weren't uh, hosting our events in one country. Uh, we were hosting our events and we made a lot of uh, movements in Europe during that time. Our advancement into the market share of uh, European MMA happened during the pandemic time because we had one of the uh, most refined uh, 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 anti-COVID uh, structure for hosting events. And this was one of the reasons we were able to host events in other countries where the government and the national bodies for uh, um, uh, dealing with regulating uh, COVID was very happy with and we were able to do that so that was one of the biggest reasons really and uh, at the same time you 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 end up having a continent that you're working really hard in and there's a momentum going and a lot of factors come in so uh, for us uh, from 2020 to 2023 it was pandemic plus recovery and that was the position we were in and 2024 we were very adamant that we will go back to all the countries that we couldn't go back to in south america uh africa and uh, southeast asia all of that was a part of it, but in 2023, we did go to Southeast Asia, we did go to uh, Brazil, we did go to Colombia. So we were like, uh, we're pending Africa, so let's go and make sure that uh, uh, the first initial uh, events has to be in Africa. And that should be the goal that we set and um, uh, we made it happen, you know? All right, all right, thanks, thanks very, thanks much, uh, Mohammed. Now um, we should get into the exciting stuff, okay? Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about Brave CF 82. The main event uh, is one of the first of many in the world. Uh, in case you don't know and you're watching this interview, the main event, uh, Nkosi Ndebele versus Torres, is a trilogy that has been written. It's something of like a Game of Thrones book, if you will. Uh, it's the first trilogy that would happen on three different continents. And another caveat to this is that Ndebele made his pro debut in EFC, uh, sorry, in Brave CF uh, 19, I believe, in South Africa in the prelims. And he has fought all his pro career in 
brave and he is a champion in brave this is something that is unheard of and then he has this rivalry with torres this is this is something of storybooks right um what it, uh, in the in the belly now being sort of like the face of the bantamweight division what made your promotion like had your bandwagon on him in a sense that had your wagon on him to like push him into star stardom uh obviously i would say he's sort of like leading the pack of african fighters right now in in brave so what made you guys this, to, to to do that decision basically uh, i would give a lot of credit to Nkosi for uh, making us feel that way i mean his his talent and uh, uh, the quality of a fighter he is is uh, undeniable i mean uh, but the key thing that we always look at is when, when you look at a fighter, you scout a fighter, a lot of people just look at the records. Uh, they go to the share dogs and the topologies and they look at the records and they're like, okay, this guy has, has done so and so. Okay, he's got, got a title here, he's got a title there. Good enough for telling a story. Let's push him in, you know? And that's mm -hmm. one of the differences that we've uh, always uh, focused in Brave, that, that that's not how we look at athletes. We need to see the mentality of the athlete. I want to know how hungry and ambitious they are. You could have all the record in the world, but if you're not hungry enough to bite somebody's ears off, to become a champion, you, you, you don't, you're not fit to be a fighter, you know, you're not going to go very far. We need that hunger and ambition in these athletes. That's, that's one thing. Second is to make sure that regardless of having the hunger and ambition, you have to notice the actual undeniable quality where how much of an athlete is improving fight after fight. If you see an athlete not learning from their defeats and uh, learning from their challenges, you're looking at it and saying that there's something going wrong. I mean, all the ambition, all the love for sport, but there's something going on behind the scenes where the development program is not going the right way. And uh, we don't want to involve in the development program, but we can advise. But with Nkosi, it was, it was check, ticking all the check boxes. You know, he, he fight out a fight, he's showing quality, he's changed. He's not the same fight that you see in the last fight. Every fight, he just leaps forward in terms of the quality of his fight. And that's it's crazy. You don't see that much in a lot of athletes. That, and we've seen a lot of athletes in Brave, and we've seen from every part of the world. To see that kind of development, it's, it's something strange, you know, and you don't know what. It could be the IQ. It could be the intelligence. But this kid is something very, very different. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident that he's not going to be the same fighter that we saw a few months back in Bahrain in Brave CF80. 100% that's going to be the case. So, But on the other hand, you're looking, and we've, we were lucky enough to see the development throughout Brave, like you mentioned. He's, uh, he started with Brave, his pro career, went all the way up to becoming a champion today. And that's uh, one of the uh, stories of uh, Brave as well. This fight in the main event signifies the value of Brave. We don't have to talk about it. The case study of the main event itself is what we are all about. We're looking at Nkosi, who never knew that this should be his career. And the first time he saw what the magnitude of the sport called mixed martial art is, is when he traveled outside of South Africa and came to Bahrain for the World Championships of Amateurs uh, that, we, that was held in Bahrain. When he saw the record-breaking breaking numbers of countries that is attending, record-breaking numbers of the athletes that was attending, buildings and billboards and lampposts and lights all over the country filled with uh, mixed martial art and posters around the whole nation, he knew that this sport is not something that I've been thinking of. It's something much more big. And I could be a part of it. So if I am here and part of this glamour that's going on, this fancy thing that's going on, and all the world is here, I think I should really take this seriously. And that was a day he decided that I'm going to be an MMA fighter. He started here in Bahrain, and he became a champion here in Bahrain uh, a few months back, you know. And that's the story of... And it didn't happen because of just competing in the uh, world championship. It happened because he competed in the biggest world championship and that was the brave international combat week so if you look at brave's history it also shows what we've been contributing to the development of the sport at the amateur level and these amateurs change their minds and that's a true story of him becoming an mma fighter and we wouldn't have seen a top class mm -hmm. south african world champion today if we didn't host that world championship at that magnitude and have them to have him here to make him change his mind or make make up his mind that day and all the way to the South African event that we took the Brave event to host in uh, South Africa was when he realized that uh, he met his coach and he knew that this is going to be my training program. I'm going to take this seriously and I have a coach and a team now. So every step of the way with Brave, while he was with us, every impact of his life in his career has been something to do with Brave hosting in South Africa or being part of the combat week. And uh, here we are. He's fighting for the uh, for to defend his uh, title against the, one of the best bantamweights in the world. But on the other hand, you're looking at uh, um, Shorty Torres, who was a first KHK member. I just told you the story of before Brave, we started yeah. the KHK 
team. And Shori Torres was a founding member of that team with Khabib and Islam Makhachev. So you're talking about a guy who's been part of that system and all the way have seen every great glamour in his life when it comes to his career. And he never had a career problem ever. It was always his problem was always personal problems, whether it's family, whether it is uh, mental health, everything else around him other than career. Career was fantastic. It was all smooth right for him. Great things happening. And until he met Nkosi, that was the first career problem he's ever had. <laughs> he's never, never had another nemesis in his life. And now he realized that, hold on, I got to put all that past five, six years of personal problems to a mm -hmm. hold and mm -hmm. deal with my first career problem before everything goes away from me because I thought it will not. And in a blink of an eye, in one year time, he, from, let's say, plus 600 favorite, he went down to a split decision uh, victory where a lot of people thought he lost. And in the same year, he lost his title as well. And c people started questioning his quality. People started questioning if he was really that good. And now he's getting a time opportunity to redeem himself uh, against Nkosi, who's, like I said, every event, every fight, he's just nonstop developing and a changed fighter. So I think this is one of the best bantamweight fight in mixed martial arts currently because we have the one of the stacked roasters for bantamweight in any promotion. And I think this fight is going to be very interesting to see how it's going to end up because it's. I think it's a lot to do with a fighter like Nkosi who's uh, put all his efforts into his career. That was all his focus. Like You would not know half of the things in his personal life. Nobody has heard many things about his background or what he's going through. I mean, the basic mm -hmm. stuff, but nothing more. His story has been his uh, his career. But shorty his story has been his personal life. And for him to move and focus on his career before the guy who has been just focusing on his career for the past five, six years is going to take everything away from him. He's going to take this fight really, really seriously. And because of that, he's traveled to... Uh, outside of his circle and went to uh, Extreme Couture Gym in Las Vegas to do his training, while mm -hmm. Nkosi seen the result with uh, Soma Fight Club in Indonesia and in Bali, and he's back training with the team. So uh, two guys far away from each other, flying to a new continent to fight. You know, they're still staying in two different continents to go and fight in the third continent. So it is a, it is a crazy road. Um, I'm going to say you, sir, are a very good salesman because I have been or I've already been sold on this fight. Really, really, really excited about it. And then you said some things here and anybody watching this, I'm certain would not miss it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be Brave CF82 uh, happening in Mauritius. And uh, Farouk, remind me of the date, Farouk. May 11. May, May 11 from Mauritius. Um, can I, I just want to jump in and ask another question. Still on the card. And um, also, I also want to commend you as well. I know um, it's a good card, it's a small card with six fights. But well, this is the first time you've, you guys, uh, Brave, have put on, on a card that um, will feature all African fights. We need a fight involving an African. Previous African events, we have some foreigners, um, which, is not, which is not bad, but we're excited to see all the fights on this card involving an African fighter. And also, I uh, want to give shout out to Sam, um, your, your, um, your, your Sam Brett. I'm talking about Sam Brett. I'm the oh, yeah. manager, manager, and um, because for uh, the way he scouted these guys, um, is fantastic. We have fighters like um, Ananis Mulumba, well known in, in Africa. He fights in Nigeria and, and Congo. We also have um, Prince Lolia on the card, uh, Biko, Hewendi. So um, a massive, massive stack card. So I'd like you to tell us about the whole process of your scouting, how you, how Brave is working on scouting, getting fighters across the continent. And you mentioned you have 14 African fighters now out of 72, which is uh, massive. So tell us about the scouting process and also the matchmaking. Uh, yeah, which is why we always uh, use the word athlete relations department. And the reason why is I don't believe in matchmaking. I always say that the only place I've really heard matchmaking is when you do uh, arrange marriages, you know, and that's where the matchmaking really happens. I don't know what, what is matchmaking in sports, you know. So it's, it's a term that we've been used to because of, uh, you know, it's every term that we know is because of our passion for the sport and we created our own terms and we are going with it as we understand. But I, I think that it has to come down to less matchmaking and more of having the best fighters fight against the best. I mean, that's what we love the sport about. It was always about that. So this was the goal. And our scouting program is just like how we do our uh, expansion and development program of the uh, mixed martial art industry itself. 
hands in the dirt you know that's the goal you have to do the dirty work and for us we need to have a team of a little bit of crazy people behind the scenes to make sure that this happens who loves to watch every single fight who loves to see what's happening around the world and keep scouting but at the same time with our relationship with the local organizations national federations uh seeing the world championships at the uh international mixed martial federation african champs continentals all of this is a bigger factor for us to make sure that our scouting program is much more easier although we work work hard but with our co-promotions we have a lot of uh partner promotions who are building athletes in the national level and with the international federation we are seeing all the continents where we see the development of amateur athletes that are the top of the game and we can scout them easily from there and the national federations who are keeping an eye on uh, the next big talent next big gym everything that's going on in the industry so we keep an eye on everything that's going on within the industry uh, and that's the way we look at uh, finding these talents and a lot of conversations but uh, once we've signed the talents we let the best fight against the best there's no question about it i mean you have your five six fights to uh, build up and then you're fighting against the best in the world and that's why we've had some of the best fights in the world with Brave Combat Federation. And if you look at this card, Lolia is there uh, from the team of Kobanza. But at the same time, you're looking at him fighting against uh, the greatest amateur in the history of amateur mixed martial art who has fought eight fights in 2023, where he became the world champion, pound pound number one champion, got the award for best male athlete and got to pro level and beat everybody and finished everyone. And I think his combined record of pro uh, fights time that he's competed in a professional level is almost like four minutes or something. That's Ramzan Gitinov. You're going to see a name that is going to be one of the biggest names in mixed martial arts, the future of mixed martial arts. But uh, Kubanza promises that it's not going to be a revenge fight. It is going to be a fight that's going to be one of the biggest upsets in uh, mixed martial arts, uh, on the other hand. And that's what makes that fight super interesting. And then you have Kubanza, who's come from the same amateur IMMAF to Brave level. And you're seeing a human being that is... Uh, a science uh, study for all the uh, doctors and uh, physiologists out there to know that you can have a human of that quality, you know. So it is an interesting fight card. And then you have Huende in the co-main event against Nazarov, who's a combat summer world champion. And Huende is uh, one eye on winning this fight and make become a Tajikistan MMA killer. If he do, goes back to back beating two Tajik fighters, but at the same time, his eyes are on taking away what Nkosi uh, has right now and he believes that and he has what he deserves and he clearly mentioned that i'm not here to become a number in the bantamweight division i'm here to become the champion so he's going to keep a close eye on the main event as well and that's going to be a huge story for bantamweight division which is already a stacked division so an interesting fight card for all of us to actually enjoy as uh, fans more than anything else thank you very much for that breakdown um and analysis uh, I would like you to tell us a little bit more about the broadcasting deal. Um, where can fight fight fans get to watch this fight across the world, especially African audience? Especially African audience, people watching from Africa. Definitely. I mean, people watching from Africa, I, um, you have the NBC in Mauritius, you have the SABC that is going to be broadcasting it live. We also have our own uh, platform for Brave TV, Brave CF TV, that you can access and subscribe and uh, get the event uh, live as well. Uh, and definitely there are a few more that's not uh, in my head right now. I wasn't expecting the broadcast question, but definitely uh, we have a few more that uh, we can uh, put on the uh, screen maybe later on in the comments, you know. If, uh, yeah. But definitely you can look at the broadcast listing to see the uh, events. We, we made sure that this event is something that is different so we want to make sure there's maximum access for people from uh, all over africa at the same time they can access it on the digital media platforms as well if they don't have the uh, broadcasting uh, networks or access to that so we've got given a full access for everybody to enjoy this fight nobody will be able to miss this all right take my money take my money i'm sold uh one <laughs> one more thing uh this is a selfish question uh, first of all pardon me my camera went off uh, this is a selfish question. As a Nigerian, I look at Brave CF Africa and I don't see a Nigerian flag. It makes me hurt. It hurts me in a way. So this is a question around... I know you guys have a lot of conversations going on. Uh, my question is not just for Nigeria per se, but as you mentioned about uh, Kubanza being a physical specimen, there is millions of people like him in West Africa. Like, you know, uh, someone that comes to mind in my, my, my mind is Francis Ngannou, someone that just never went to the gym and looks like that. There are plenty, plenty people like that. Um, 
Are there any conversations coming up about involving West Africa? When I say West Africa, I'm talking about the Senegals, the Gambias, the Nigerians, the, the Cameroons, Ghanas, and all these places. Are there any conversations around maybe athletes or maybe hosting events around that area? Absolutely. I mean, uh, even when you, you mentioned Franz Ngannou, um, a fantastic athlete. Uh, I mean, he's uh, definitely uh, a, a specimen himself, you know. And yeah. uh, for us, we knew that uh, before UFC or anything else, uh, we got him to Bahrain to fight his fight here with uh, before he went Bahrain with our KHK team. And uh, when he had the KHK tryouts competition here is when people had the eyeballs on uh, Ngannou when he beat uh, the Jungle Fight uh, Championship champion who was the draw to actually go to UFC. But, uh, and mm -hmm. then Nganu destroys him and they, they're like, where did this guy come from, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and and that's one of the feelings that I got from Kubanza. It's, it's similar, he was not as big as Nganu, but when I sat, stood for face off with Nganu here in Bahrain, I didn't feel really good standing next to him, you know? I, 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 it was, it's not a great feeling, but to answer your question, absolutely. I mean, when, when I will tell you this here. Um, our plan for 2024 and 2025 in Africa is a case study of what we have done since the beginning. We've been in Africa and we continue to be in Africa and we're returning back to Africa and we've had talents nonstop from Africa competing in Brave. But now it's time to build the whole structure. We're bringing the whole ecosystem into Africa from uh, creating academies, training centers to uh, supporting athletes to uh, creating, uh, bringing private sectors to contribute to the development of MMA in the in the region and uh, making sure the national federations are empowered and we have bigger African championships every single year where the uh, uh, continental or national federations can be a part of and uh, be involved in and go to every country and empower the national federations with their own government bodies, sports bodies and the private sectors using all our network. So it is a massive project that is going on for Africa as a whole and definitely our uh, target is to make 2025 our entry into Africa through Nigeria. So we want to host our event in Nigeria in 2025. And that's definitely our plan. Uh, and uh, the African Championship that's going to be taking place, I think, next month or so will be one of the most interesting scouting programs for African talent. It's going to be an interesting thing to look forward to. But at the same time, like you said, we are having a lot of talks with uh, the existing teams and managers uh, and federations to look out for the next big talent uh, from all over Africa. But Nigeria specifically, the reason we signed a deal with Airtel TV in Nigeria was to make sure that we uh, showcase what Brave is and what the opportunity for the fighters uh, uh, in Nigeria is to be part of this organization. So we want to give them that uh, information and uh, coming back to Africa and being able to watch that we are here in their home continent. Uh, it just gives more hope and uh, feeling that this is not far away from us. It, this is achievable, you know, and that's the feeling we want to give. Uh, and eventually next year we will go to Nigeria and that's what we're working on and it's not done until it's done for sure uh anything could happen on the way but uh primary goal next event in Africa in 2025 is definitely going to be Nigeria is our plan at this stage but nothing is concrete and signed as of yet but to answer your question 100 percent all right, uh, that's it from me, and I believe, Farouk, uh, that's it from you. We said we were going to spend 20 minutes, but you've been kind enough to to just go above half an hour. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, this has been a very, very insightful conversation. Um, to be honest, I did not expect you to be this cool. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think the pictures yeah. don't give that. Don't yeah. Give that. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, Farouk? You, you've got anything yeah. to say before we go? Yeah, I got one more question. Yeah, since we know we're, we're expecting um, um, Brave in, in Nigeria, that's a breaking news. So one more question. Um, I, I'd like to get your response with this. I've seen Brave, you talk about building an ecosystem, building a one combat sport um, federation. You talk about the World Cup, which I think we'll talk about in another interview. Hopefully we'll get to you again. But my big question is I've seen Brave collaborate with other promotion in Europe. You guys are the only promotion being able to collaborate you are not intimidated by others. You are not scared of others. Have you thought about collaborating with any promotion in Africa? We talk about coming to Nigeria next year. We have the African Knockout, a, a big, the big promote, number one promotion in Nigeria at the moment. Is there any conversation with AQO on collaborating or 
Are you looking at other promotion? Definitely. I think with um, AKO, we did some collaborations. I mean, not a co-promotion format, but I think it, one of the reality shows that went on Netflix, we had a collaboration with them on that. So Brave is, like you said, uh, is always and always have been open to all kinds of collaboration. Um, the small-minded thought of, uh, oh, what if we compete? It becomes a competition or it becomes uh, my fighter against your fighter. That is not... That, that never exists. We are organizations that are developing sports and the fighters have to worry about that. They have to showcase it the best. If you th believe that you are signing the best fighters who wants to be the best fighters, uh, then you allow them the platform and they let them prove that they're the best fighters, that the sport will decide who's best or not. So we don't have that mindset in, in when it comes to co-promotion. It's always about how we as a top level organizations can work together and build something together. And that uh, offer is even on African fighters, I will throw it out there. That offer stands for every single organization that's out there who wants to partner with us. We are always happy to have that discussion. There is no other uh, politics or thoughts or anything behind it. We have only one goal, and that is to develop the sport of mixed martial art from an event business to a sports business. So we've always had those uh, arms open wide. We've always tried to contact everybody else to make those uh, deals happen. But um, it's nobody's fault, you know, circumstances, situations. Some happen, some doesn't happen. I mean, to have uh, as many co-promotions as we did, we must have spoken to three times more uh, organizations to make this amount happen, you know? So it's always that work. And uh, it's just about maybe it's the right time, maybe it's not the right time for the organizations. And when it's the right time, we will come and uh, collaborate with them. So uh, definitely we are always open to that. That's why we work with the federations. That's why we work with the local organizations, uh, promotions outside of uh, uh, Africa. And we keep doing that. So definitely uh, we are happy to do that. We're happy to look forward to how we can collaborate. And uh, like I said, this, vision or ambition for developing mixed martial under one umbrella like the FIFA structure is never going to happen alone. No individual, no organization, no uh, person can make it happen. It has to be a collaborative work between every sector of the industry from media side, your support, your interviews. These are very crucial for us to make sure that what we are trying to show to the private sectors and the governments, it is important that the MMA world understands this and you take that uh, message to the MMA world. When we bring those uh, partnerships, we're all going to benefit from it. And it is a collaborated effort that we have to do it together, you know. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you for the um, in-depth uh, explanation. Jibril, that's all, all right, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Uh, we are going to allow uh, Mr. Shahid to get back to his life. <laughs> Thank you for allowing us to be part of it today and uh yes please uh, do reach out follow brave cf on social media i'm sure you already do uh brave cf 82 in mauritius happening saturday 11th of may uh you can watch it on sab uh sabc south africa sabc in south africa nwtv and yes of course star times i just got a text now from chichi <laughs> you can watch it on star times in africa star times uh, in nigeria as well so uh anywhere you are in africa you could get you could get to watch brave and also obviously on the brave uh, tv platform as well all right uh everybody thank you thank you and uh, uh salute enjoy the rest of your day bye now Come on, Africans! Uh -huh.